right. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks so much for, for coming. Uh, my I'm Kevin Kress, uh, and my talk is called Beyond ArcViz, uh, using Blender for small-scale design build projects. Um, so who am I? Um, I'm an aspiring architect. I'm just finishing up my, my master's degree at the University of Waterloo, uh, and a designer who uses um, Blender as his sort of predominant design tool whenever I can. Um, so I started using uh, sort of 3D animation software when I was pretty young. Uh, it's me up in the corner and my, my brother helping me out there learn to use a computer. Um, but it was a bit later when I started using uh, a software called Animator as sort of the first 3D software I've, I'd ever used. And it was uh, free but not open source. Uh, and then a, a cousin of mine mentioned at a family gathering about this software called Blender. Um, and I was very excited to, to hear about it, and I, I raced home and I downloaded Blender 2.49, uh, and I was met with this, and I was very quickly uh, a bit overwhelmed. <laughs> and it wasn't until uh, the 2.5 release um, and the Sintel Open movie um, that you know I saw this and I thought, you know, wow, the visuals that this software creates are just incredible. Um, you know, I should dive back into it, give it another shot, and see what happens. Uh, and I followed a bunch of tutorials online, um, and eventually uh, got to the point where I could, you know, start to create some visualization and some renders like this. Uh, and I used these in my portfolio to get into architecture school. Uh, and sort of throughout my um, my student work, I've been been using Blender to create sort of visualizations and renders like this, and like this, and like this. But what I want to talk about today, you know, there's going to be some other great talks going on um, throughout the conference about using Blender as architect an architectural visualization tool. What I want to talk about um, today is using Blender as a conceptual design tool and as uh, a tool for construction and fabrication of small, small design build projects. Um, so this is a, a quote from Alexandra Siglas and Theodoros Dunas. Uh, in a paper they wrote for the, the ECADE conference on uh, education in, in architecture and computer-aided design. Uh, and they noted um, through their experience using Blender in architectural studio projects that modeling and other workflows in Blender um, don't try to hide the way that the computer handles 3D computer graphics and that the designer is exposed to the mechanics of the computer graphics and that the sort of modular approach of these modeling tools helps students develop a design thinking uh, and use Blender as a decision-making tool in their design and not just as a visualization tool. Uh, and that's something I've found in my own experience as well, as I, I hope I'll show through some of the projects. Um, so I want to talk about uh, when I got into architecture school, I was up at the uh, Laurentian School of Architecture, which is now the McEwen School of Architecture uh, in Sudbury, Ontario. And a big part of their uh, sort of program's philosophy is doing design build. Um, so one of our first projects in our first year was this, uh, this ice hut. Uh, it was a group of, of six of us that worked on this project. Uh, and the idea was that it would sit and be kind of this um, bright sort of beacon and almost a lantern on the winter landscape. Um, so we used uh, Blender for a lot of the early concepts. It was really helpful uh, and for us to be able to get a sense of the visuals, of the, the light and the texture and the material, uh, especially at sort of the, the nighttime images, which we wanted to, to convey. Um, so we went through a couple of design iterations uh, using Blender to simulate uh, how the different materials would, would play with light and shadow on the landscape. Um, we were using uh, acrylic for the windows, uh, plywood for the main sort of sheathing of the body, and a material called coroplast, uh, which is sort of a translucent plastic um, for those sort of uh, translucent red highlights there. And this was sort of the, the final design that we settled on. Um, you know, simple enough to have, have some visual interest and some facets to it, uh, but nothing too complex. And so, you know, again, we used um, Blender to do the, the framing diagrams, um, using sort of a V-framing to account for those windows, uh, as opposed to sort of a regular stick framing. Uh, and also, you know, Blender was very helpful in, you know, making sure we were getting our cut angles correct and, and dealing with sort of the, the compound angle of that roof. Um, once we had the design finalized, um, we used uh, Blender's sort of linked data, linked objects, uh, in order to develop some, some cut sheets on our material. Um, so these, um, let's see if you can see my mouse here. Um, so each, so each of these um, cut sheets was linked to the main model. So as we made adjustments to the main model, we could 
adjust how that would, would show up on our material cut sheets. Uh, and then we simply just printed those directly one-to-one, -one, traced them onto our material, and, and did the cuts. Um, this is a bit of the fabrication process. Uh, we did that for the roof material as well. Um, the whole thing starting to come together here. And that led us to the final. Um, so that ability to sort of link our material sheets to the main object and have them generated uh, as we were working and working through the design was, was something that was really helpful uh, in terms of managing our project budget and, and making the design come together. Uh, this was a, a more recent project uh, that just finished up last week. This was a, a trade show booth that I did for uh, Cocoa 40, uh, which is an incredible chocolate company. If you're in uh, North America, you should definitely check them out. I'm not sure if they ship internationally. Um, <laughs> But so this was the, the design of the trade show booth. So again, you know, we did that uh, early render, you know, modeled in Blender. Um, using the EV render engine in, in 2.8, it's amazing because you can sort of prototype stuff like this right in front of the client, which is great for getting feedback. Um, and then, again, same sort of thing, um, using uh, linked, linking the objects and developing cut sheets uh, for the material for that, uh, as well as, um, DXFs and sort of more standard CAD files that were sent to a laser cutter to do the, the facets on the front. Um, this is another project. Uh, so this was a, a third year design build project for a sauna. Um, and what we did, uh, we wanted to make sure that the, the benches in the sauna sort of were nice and ergonomic and fit to the human body. Uh, so we got one of our potential clients, we got them out in the, the deep snow of the cold Northern Ontario winter. Uh, we had them lie down in a snowbank and kind of shaped the snow to their body, and then we 3D scanned that um, using uh, one, two, three D catch at the time. But now you've got uh, tools like Meshroom and other open source alternatives to that. Brought that into Blender and then used it um, to develop the shape of the benches so that they would kind of match with the shape of the body. Um, that's sort of a render of how the the shapes worked out uh, and the shapes under construction there. Uh, this was another another project experimenting with. Um, one thing that I really enjoy about using Blender is the ability to uh, very fluidly navigate perspective views of a project. Um, so this was for a, a charity event called Canstruction uh, that's run for the local food bank where they bring in different artists to, um, and design teams to, to do little installations. Um, so this, the idea was that this is a, a forced perspective illusion. So when you stand from a, a certain point, it makes the A logo that you see, see in the first image. And this was all done with uh, cans of, of chicken and tuna. Um, and there's the, the final result. Uh, and again, so this was, we mapped this all out in Blender, um, used some, some projection mapping to get the logo correct and figure out the number of cans that we'd need. And then we just printed this plan out one-to-one, -one, dropped it down on the floor, uh, and did the construction. Oh, uh, this is a image that's not loading. Um, anyway, so uh, this, other, this next project uh, is a pavilion that we did um, up for one of the science centers uh, in Sudbury, Ontario called Dynamic Earth. Um, and they wanted um, sort of a pavilion that spoke to uh, the history of Sudbury. So it's a, a mining town um, and they've made a lot of effort to become more sort of environmentally conscious in the operation of the, um, of the mines. Uh, and part of that is uh, what's known quite fondly in Sudbury as the super stack. Uh, it's a 370 meter tall uh, smokestack that helps um, disperse the, the pollution that's coming out from the mine smelting process uh, as, a, as an alternative to uh, the large uh, roast beds that they used to use uh, far back in the past, which is the bottom image there. Um, and one thing that's really great about how the mine operations have changed over the years is that they're getting to the point where uh, they've reduced emissions so much that they no longer need the super stack. Uh, so it's going to be being removed and brought down in the next couple of years. Um, so we wanted to design a pavilion that framed that uh, and would still give people a sense of where the stack was and what an icon it was to the town uh, when it was up and kind of memorialize it, but also talk about sort of the environmental progress that. Uh, that the mining companies have made. So the idea was this uh, charred wood uh, pavilion, kind of reminiscent both of the old roast beds and of the stack itself, um, that frames the stack. And again, uh, Blunder's perspective tools were 
Uh, unfortunately, the video is not loading. Um, incredibly essential in making sure those perspectives lined up and making sure that when people were sitting in the benches in the pavilion, um, that top line of the stacks would be, um, top line of the slats would be right lined up with uh, where the, the top of the stack was. Uh, so these are just a couple images of the construction process. Um, we went about uh, sort of burning red cedar uh, as a finish um, and then collecting it into this sort of uh, almost octagonal shape. And there's, that's sort of the, the final image of the stack there. This project, we started to come up against one of Blender's limitations uh, in this type of project, which is, um, you know, because this was a public project on, on public land, uh, we, had, we had to submit a set of uh, working drawings and construction drawings to the city for approvals. Um, and this, of course, is something that's sort of not natively supported in Blender's feature set, uh, so we had to export um, a fair bit of this work was done in Adobe Illustrator and Rhinoceros um, for the actual working drawings. Uh, this is another project, uh, probably the most uh, conventional architectural project of the, the ones uh, that I have. But uh, So this is a set of two mass timber cottages uh, up at the Lodge at Pine Cove, also in northern Ontario. And um, the Lodge knew that they were looking for um, something that was sort of modular and something that could be prefabricated. Uh, so we did a couple experiments with sort of um, parametric framing ideas in Blender. Originally, we were looking at uh, standard stick frame prefabrication, but we ended up going with, um, oops, stuck on the slide here. We ended up going with a mass timber solution instead. Um, but these were just a couple of the mock-ups that we did early on. Um, at this point, we were using Blender internal, but um, now we've sort of updated the operation to use Eevee. Uh, these are a couple, couple shots of the construction. But again, we ran into that limitation of, you know, because we needed to send these out to a manufacturer, because we need to get approval from the city, um, we had to export these Blender models to a more traditional CAD software um, to do the working drawings. And so the big takeaway was that sort of in my experience using this uh, in my education and in a couple of the outside projects was that Blender can be a really fantastic designs tool for these small-scale projects, especially if you're um, constructing them yourself or with a, a small team that you're involved in. Um, but you start to run into challenges when you get into the need to produce more traditional documentation and drawings for you know, approvals by planning departments, um, manufacturers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, when I finally got into my... Um, my master's here and was starting to try to come up with a, a topic to work on for my, my thesis dissertation, I wanted to see if I could uh, take a look at addressing this and seeing if I could make Blender into a platform uh, that could be used, an open source platform that could be used right through the architectural production process uh, and actually start to produce some of those simple working drawings within Blender itself. Um, so I've been developing an add-on uh, called Measure at Arc. Um, and it's based on the Measure It tools that were developed by Antonio Vasquez. I'm not sure if he's at the conference uh, here, but he's also the developer of the Grease Pencil tools, uh, one of the main developers on the Grease Pencil tools. Um, and he had this you know, really strong foundation um, base of an add-on for adding dimensions into Blender models. Um, but they were sort of drawn in screen space. They wouldn't be occluded by objects. Uh, there wasn't sort of a fully fleshed out style system. So I wanted to see if I could sort of address some of those, those issues. Um, so Measure at Arc, the add-on, uh, adds support for uh, doing sort of standard line work, uh, dimensions, and annotations within Blender. Um, the line work uh, is kind of a real-time alternative to uh, the freestyle line drawing system, which I had been using previously whenever I had to export line work from Blender. Um, but I wanted something that was you know, much more simple. A freestyle, of course, offers a lot more stylistic opportunity when you're rendering your line work, but I wanted something that just did simple line work uh, that was very fast and responsive and worked in the 3D viewport. Um, so there's just a couple of options for, you know, dashes and silhouettes and that kind of thing, but it, you know, responds adaptively in the viewport. 
uh, and this is just it, working on a, a larger sort of GIS model of Sudbury, Ontario. And I wanted it to be sort of very simple to add in this line work um, in the 3D view. So it is based um, on manual selection of edges, um, unlike some other systems, but uh, there is an operator that I've put in that will uh, select those lines based on the crease angle uh, that you have specified in Blender, uh, just to streamline the process if you have some complex geometry. Uh, dimensions themselves are uh, an attempt to deal with sort of one of the frustrations I've had with common uh, CAD software, which is the need to redefine a work plane when you're dimensioning in, in 3D. Um, so, you know, unlike tools like uh, Rhino and Revit, where you're constantly having to redefine that work plane for every, you know, different planar surface that you're dimensioning, um, these dimensions are based instead on the actual geometry of the object, and they attempt to um, place themselves intelligently based on um, the object's topology and your current viewpoint position in the scene. Um, another sort of frustration I've had with sort of conventional CAD software is that uh, you've got sort of the, the click a point, click a point, drag out to place uh, workflow for placing dimensions, and I wanted something that you could just select a whole set of edges um, and hit the dimension button and it would bring them all in. Uh, this was something that was uh, present in um, in Antonio's original measure add-on, but it was something that I wanted to maintain as I was sort of refactoring the dimension code to make sure that it would uh, work in sort of uh, proper three-dimensional space uh, with proper occlusion and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing was sort of the automatic orientation. I wanted the dimensions to be able to adjust themselves as you move around um, so that if you're, you know, in a plan view and you're switching to a section view and you want those things to to stay consistent and not have to redefine uh, dimensions as you move around the object um, for different views. And right now I've got uh, single axis and aligned dimensions uh, in place, so you can have a dimension that just measures along any of the cardinal axis, axes, or uh, ones that say aligned to the, the line of geometry that they're measuring. And hopefully the internet's gonna run, but this was just a quick a uh, demo video of some of the tools in action. I'll just skip to where I start sort of defining line work. And so I'm using Measure It to draw the, Measure It Arc to draw the, the contour lines. Um, on the landscape, as well as sort of the silhouette lines around. Um, the darkened edges uh, that you're seeing in the, the cut views are actually done with a Boolean modifier because um, the resulting cut from the Boolean modifier will inherit the material uh, that the cutting object uses. Uh, so that's a fast way to do, to do cut lines in Blender. Uh, and so what you get is sort of the option to take a simple unannotated um, Blender render and add in some of that sort of architectural detailing to it. Uh, and it lets you sort of combine this with all of Blender's other feature sets, which are phenomenal for architectural design. You know, the ability to use the grease pencil tools and EV and all of these other amazing features, um, you know, that the amazing developers of Blender have been adding in 2.8, um, which can be, you know, huge time savers uh, in an architectural design project. And, you know, grease pencil especially helps kind of bring the sketchbook into the 3D software, which I think is phenomenal. Um, so these are just a couple uh, composite images I've produced um, using Measure at Arc and, and Eevee. Um, this is just kind of showing how I'm um, using sort of the workbench render engine and Eevee in combination here. So um, how you can transition from sort of a typical um, working drawing style uh, over into the fully rendered image very quickly. And these are just a, a couple more uh, plans that I've been, been producing. Uh, this is more work uh, that I've been doing for, for the Logit Pine Cove. Um, they've been great and very, very supportive and very patient with me as I test out these tools on their projects, and I, I can't thank them enough for that. So, um, And again, you know, it just allows you to switch back and forth between the, the rendered preview and the plan drawing very quickly, which is um, something that's kind of unique to Blender. 
and then that's just uh, showing how the, the dimensions sort of start to reorient themselves as you move around. So um, that's kind of uh, it for me today, but I just want to bring up sort of some next steps and things that I'd like to, to work on and improve in this add-on, um, and also sort of talk about um, some things that other people in the Blender community are doing. Um, IFC support would be a huge one for architectural work using Blender, and uh, Dion Molt down in uh, Sydney, Australia has been developing an add-on uh, that, that handles IFC export of Blender geometry, and it's um, really phenomenal. You know, it's uh, a work in progress, but it, there's a whole lot of potential there. Um, there's, oh, I, I've lost his name, and I'm, I apologize, but um, there's also uh, someone else in the Blender community on Twitter who's been uh, working on dimensions that are actually reactive, where you can sort of click on the dimension number, enter a new number, um, and it will adjust the, sp the spacing um, again, which is sort of commonplace in, in most CAD tools, so adding that sort of interactivity to the dimensions and uh, sort of a constraint system. Um, another thing would be, uh, you know, scheduling. Blender has so much capacity to add custom metadata to your objects um, that I think some kind of scheduling system that makes use of that data uh, and can export it into, you know, an Excel file or a CSV file would be phenomenal. Um, and then something that I've been working on as a next step uh, would be sort of individual camera sizing and better uh, sort of more intuitive orthographic scale settings um, to allow you to sort of set up your panels and your drawings. Um, yeah, and that's it for me. Uh, thanks so much for, for listening to my talk. Uh, if you're interested in, in testing out uh, Measure at Arc, that's the, the GitHub link there and the, the YouTube link to uh, a channel where I've been trying to post update videos as, as things move along. Uh, I also want to say a big thank you to all of the conference organizers. You know, it's amazing to get to to come and talk about about Blender. Uh, and yeah, and thanks so much to to all of the team members. You know, each of those design build projects was was a big team effort with teams ranging from you know five to to eighteen people. So uh, I have to give a thank you to the all the team members. Yeah, thanks so much. How are we on time? Does uh, anyone have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, here I'll bring the mic. One of the, one of the problem I had with the Mesurit add-on is that uh, you have to use it at the end of the project. So as an example, you make a cube that is the shape of the house, you put the, the, mesuri, the, the measurements, and then you make loop cuts to put the, the windows and then you lose the, because I think it's reorganizing the, the, do you think there is a way for your add-on to handle this, that you can keep the, the measurements if you add the geometry? Yeah, that's actually uh, one of the things I've been trying to solve. Um, I've been working, I've got it uh, a little bit more stable if you're using modifiers, um, so you can make sort of Boolean cuts and not, not affect it. Um, but as soon as you apply those modifiers, then you do start to run into that same issue. Um, I do think it's definitely something that's possible to overcome. I need to look into a little bit more the the Python event handler system and uh, and that kind of thing because there should be a way to you know um, when that mesh data is updated to just do a quick run through and check if the vertex index still matches the position that it was at uh, before or is at least within some sort of you know tolerable threshold and then sort of reassign the indices based on that. Um, so I do think it's a, a solvable problem, but it's not one I've, I've solved yet. <laughs> uh, also, not yet. Um, what I'm looking at, too, is um, an option to convert um, measure its line work into grease pencil line work. Um, and I believe there's some work being done on uh, vector, either SVG or, or um, other sort of vector formats for, um, for the grease pencil object um, data. So I'm hoping that will be kind of the, the best path forward for that. Are there different levels of metric measurement possible? Millimeters, centimeters, meters? Uh, yeah, so right now it's um, 
pulling all of the unit information from Blender's unit system. Um, so in the same way, you'd, you'd change your scene units, um, measure, it, measure it arcs. Um, annotations will uh, change to reflect that, yeah. All right, great. Thanks so much, everyone.